In the first episode, we were introduced to the ghost who wrote the Constitution, the 35-year-old who most of America has never heard of. If you haven't listened to or watched that episode, that will provide the context and a full appreciation for this episode. And so now, spoiler alert, the ghost was a man named Gouverneur Morris. Melanie Miller has been the editor of the Gouverneur Morris papers. She's written two books on Morris. She describes him as a national treasure, that he wrote the entire preamble to the Constitution and drafted the final version. Quote, using the powerful and succinct prose that was one of his great gifts, an extraordinary orator, and his speeches at the convention and in the Senate are well worth reading. He chaired the commission that designed the Manhattan Street Grid and headed the Erie Canal Commission. Morris was the true father of the canal, contrary to the view of many historians. There is a lot to like about Morris. He was humane. He was a soft touch. He was fair and particularly appealing. He could be very funny and could ridicule himself." End quote. As to why he's been vanquished from the public memory at large, Melanie Miller says, quote, "...his exuberance and outspokenness were always offensive to some. His exoriation of slavery was one of the most eloquent speeches at the Constitutional Convention and made him no friends in the South. His dire and accurate predictions about the course of the French Revolution were not popular in France or in America. During his time in France, Morris was the object of clandestine attacks by people like Jefferson's secretary, William Short, who dearly wanted the position of minister himself, and others who saw him as an obstacle to profiteering from the American Revolution. Even Hamilton denigrated him falsely to Washington in a sorry episode when Morris's reports conflicted with Hamilton's foreign policy goals. All of these attacks were circulated and prejudiced many against him, and some are still repeated by historians. There are significant exceptions. Washington always liked and respected him. In addition, Morris was a Federalist, and thus in the dwindling minority after Jefferson's election. He bitterly opposed the War of 1812, which he considered the height of idiocy. And that, too, did not make him popular then or now. So that gets us up to speed with as good as any summary in modern times. But let's go back to 1888 and Teddy Roosevelt, who wrote a biography of Morris, 72 years after Morris had died. Roosevelt wrote it before he was president, back when he was a New York assemblyman and a prolific author. Here's an excerpt from the foreword. Quote, two generations ago, the average American biographer was certainly a marvel of turgid, meaning bloated, and aimless verbosity, meaning American biographers of the founding fathers used a lot of unnecessary words. The reputations of our early statesmen have in no way proved of their vitality more clearly than by surviving their entombment in the pages of the authors who immediately seceded them. Roosevelt sang that the humanity of our founding fathers survived being buried in those boring books. And Roosevelt goes on, quote, no one of the founders of the Constitution has suffered more in this respect than has he who was perhaps the most brilliant, although by no means the greatest of the whole number, end quote. Now, I obviously disagree with Roosevelt in his assessment that Morris was not the greatest of them, but I think we have different criterion. Roosevelt goes on to describe how Morris gets buried in the public memory. Quote, Jared Sparks, hitherto Morris's sole biographer, meaning until now, Morris's sole biographer, wrote innumerable volumes on American history, some of them almost indispensable to the student. Mr. Sparks, is not only a very voluminous writer, but he is also a quite abnormally dull one. His life of Gouverneur Morris is typical of most of his work. He collected with great industry facts about Mr. Morris with numerous selections, not always well chosen from his diary. Other merits, the book has none. He failed to understand that a biographer's duties are not necessarily identical with those of a professional eulogist, meaning someone who speaks at a funeral. But for this, he is hardly to blame. 
as all our writers then, seemed to think it necessary to shower indiscriminate praise on every dead American, whether author, soldier, politician, or whatnot, save only Benedict Arnold, end quote. Benedict Arnold, of course, was an early hero of the Revolutionary War, who later became one of the most infamous traitors in U.S. history, defecting to the British side. Benedict Arnold's name has become synonymous with being a traitor. So then Roosevelt covers the Constitutional Convention. He talks about the small number of delegates led by Morris, who were confronting the Southern delegates over slavery and being, quote, very loath either to allow the South additional representation for the slaves or to permit the foreign trade in them to go on. When the Southern members banded together on this issue and made it evident that it was the one which they regarded as almost the most important of all, Morris attacked them in a telling speech, stating with his usual boldness facts that most Northerners only dared hint at. He characterized the proportional representation as being a bribe for the importation of slaves. Roosevelt describes, quote, in shameful contrast, many of the Northerners championed the institution, in particular, Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut, whose name should be branded with infamy because of the words he then uttered. He actually advocated the free importation of Negroes into the South Atlantic states because the slaves, quote, died so fast in the sickly rice swamps that it was necessary ever to bring fresh ones to labor and perish in the places of their predecessors. And with a brutal cynicism, peculiarly revolting from its mercantile baseness, meaning its materialistic lack of humanity, Ellsworth brushed aside the question of morality as irrelevant, asking his hearers to pay heed only to the fact that, quote, what enriches the part enriches the whole, end quote. Roosevelt speaks of the final stalemate. Quote, the Virginians were opposed to the slave trade, but South Carolina and Georgia made it a condition of their coming into the Union. It was accordingly agreed that it should be allowed for a limited time, 12 years, and this was afterwards extended to 20 by a bargain made by Maryland and the three South Atlantic states with the New England states, the latter getting in return the help of the former to alter certain provisions respecting commerce. One of the main industries of the New England of that day was the manufacture of rum. And its citizens cared more for their distilleries than for all the slaves held in bondage throughout Christendom. The rum was made from molasses, which they imported from the West Indies. And they carried there in return the fish taken by their great fishing fleets and they also carried the slaves into the southern ports. Their commerce was what they especially relied on, and to gain support for it, they were perfectly willing to make terms with even such a black mammon of unrighteousness as the southern slaveholding system. Throughout the contest, Morris and a few other stout anti-slavery men are the only ones who appear to advantage. The Virginians, who were honorably anxious to minimize the evils of slavery come next. Then the other Southerners, who allowed pressing self-interest to overcome their scruples. And last of all, the New Englanders, whom a comparatively trivial self-interest made them the willing allies of the extreme slaveholders. These last were the only Northerners who yielded anything to the Southern slaveholders, that was not absolutely necessary. And yet they were the forefathers of the most determined and effective foes that slavery ever had. As already said, the Southerners stood firm on the slave question. It was the one which perhaps more than any other offered the most serious obstacle to a settlement. Madison pointed out, quote, that the real difference lay not between the small states and the large, but between the northern and southern states. The institution of slavery and its consequences formed the real line of discrimination." End quote on Madison. To talk of this kind, Morris at first answered hotly enough, quote, he saw that the southern gentlemen would not be satisfied unless they saw the way open 
to their gaining a majority in the public councils. If the distinction they set up between the North and South was real, instead of attempting to blend incompatible things, let them at once take a friendly leave of each other, end quote, on Governor Morris. He afterwards went back from this position and agreed the compromise by which the slaves were to add by three-fifths of their number to the representation of their masters, and the slave trade was to be allowed for a certain number of years and prohibited forever after. He showed his usual straightforward willingness to call things by their right name in desiring to see slavery named outright in the Constitution instead of being characterized with cowardly circumlocution as was actually done. End quote. On Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt then makes his argument that if they had not compromised over slavery, there would have been two republics and the slave states would have ended up taking the West and the practice would have continued for longer. He frames Gouverneur Morris as someone committed at times to principles that create disorder rather than order, like Washington. Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from a Birmingham jail described this type of thinking as the great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom saying, quote, it's not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, end quote. Although Theodore Roosevelt was perhaps progressive in his anti-monopoly positions, he was hardly a white moderate. He was a white supremacist as far as his positions and opinions on Native Americans were concerned. Theodore Roosevelt made some of the most shocking statements in American history, which is saying a lot. Essentially, that it was to the benefit of Native Americans that they were almost wiped off the face of the earth because the Anglo-Saxon race was superior. He also thought it was out of the question to expect Texans to submit to the mastery of the weaker race, speaking about Mexicans. He wanted education for Native Americans but for the purposes of assimilation, he felt higher education wouldn't be necessary. He actually said this, quote, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indian is the dead Indian, but I believe nine out of every ten are, and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the tenth. The most vicious cowboy has more principle than the average Indian, end quote. So you might be thinking, why would we care about anything Theodore Roosevelt has to say? Because this is the historical reality of the country, and it's through his lens that we get to know Morris, who the year he writes his book includes that one of the best resources for Gouverneur Morris's legacy is Morris's granddaughter, Anne Carey Morris, who's at that time written two articles in Scribner's Magazine for January and February in 1887 about her grandfather's life in Paris during the French Revolution giving new and interesting details. Well, later that year, after Roosevelt published his book in 1888, Anne Carey Morris published an entire book on her grandfather. And she encourages us to know him better in her foreword, where she says, quote, Americans will doubtless accord ready sympathy to a man who was truly an American and at a time when thus to proclaim his principles attested an independence, careless of unpopularity. Possibly, too, our kindred overseas may find something of interest in the career of one who, though a rebel against England, spent the best years of his life assisting in the formation of a government under which the poor of the earth might find an asylum and whose views were consistently favorable to the peace and happiness of mankind. That's Anne Carey Morris. And it's in her assembly we hear from Morris himself at long last. Much of the work, the letters, the diary entries describe Morris's accounts of the revolution in France, his correspondence with his fellow founding fathers in America, his assessments of the French constitutional discussions, the upheaval, the terror, and his opinions on the matter. And there is also this dramatic and illuminating letter that I'm gonna read portions of. It's dense. I'm going to give the definitions to words I think people might not know. Some of them had a different meaning at the time than they do now. 
Anne Carey Morris, his granddaughter, introduces this particular letter as follows. Morris had for months imposed upon himself a strict silence on public affairs. But after the beginning of the year 1811, his letters became more full of the alarming questions agitating the country. She's speaking of the impending second war with the United Kingdom. Quote, Morris spoke in a letter to a friend, Robert Walsh of Philadelphia, February 5th, 1811, saying, now here is Gouverneur Morris. Quote, at different times, I have taken up my pen to communicate what I believed might be useful and then laid it down again from recollection of the text, if they will not believe Moses and the prophets, neither would they believe though one should rise from the dead. Montesquieu said tritely, he did not write to make people read, but to make them think. Did he live in our day, in our country, he would find it no easy matter to make them read. Truth is that the adherents of the ruling party shun information. Such of them as are deceived do not wish to be undeceived. The mischief lies deeper, I fear, than is generally supposed by good men. Ignorant as the mass of mankind must of necessity and forever be of the great political subjects, it is not so much the ignorance as the depravity, meaning the corruptibility of our citizens, which causes their misfortune. So much has been said on certain subjects that it is almost impossible not to comprehend. And so much has been felt that the most stubborn are brought to a practical conviction. But the choice of rulers continues the same because those who choose, and more especially, those by whom they are influenced and led, have a personal interest in the constitution and continuation of a bad government. They do themselves the justice to feel that by a wise and good administration, they would neither be employed nor trusted. Many, therefore, who think with us, act against us. A national condition of this sort cannot long continue. National misfortune, which is the certain consequence, is also the natural correction of national corruption. All history bears witness to this truth so often proclaimed in the sacred writings. Excuse me, perhaps I am not sufficiently philosophical for the fashion of our day, but that which from reading was faith has by experience become conviction. Speaking of General Hamilton, he had little share in forming the Constitution. Now Gouverneur Morris is speaking of Alexander Hamilton, the founding father about which that musical was made. And this is fascinating, not only because it gives us a more realistic depiction of Hamilton, but because of the insight into how these men thought. Hamilton was a friend of Morris who had died in 1804, seven years before Morris wrote this. Quote, speaking of General Hamilton, he had little share in forming the Constitution. He disliked it believing all Republican government to be radically defective. He admired, nevertheless, the British Constitution, which I consider as an aristocracy in fact, though a monarchy in name. General Hamilton hated Republican government because he confounded it, meaning confused it, with democratical government. And he detested the latter democratic government because he believed it must end in despotism, meaning a kind of fascism and be in the meantime destructive to public morality. He believed that our administration would be enfeebled progressively at every new election and become at last contemptible. Hamilton apprehended that the minions of faction would sell themselves and their country as soon as foreign powers should think it worthwhile to make the purchase. In short, Hamilton's study of ancient history impressed on his mind a conviction that democracy ending in tyranny is, while it lasts, a cruel and oppressing domination. Those were Gouverneur Morris's words about Alexander Hamilton. He then goes on to say, quote, that which at the time our constitution was formed had been generated by friendship in the Revolutionary War was sinking 
Under the pressure of state interest, commercial rivalry, the pursuit of wealth, and those thousand giddy projects, which the intoxication of independence, an extravagant idea of our own importance, a profound ignorance of other nations, the prostration of the public credit and the paucity of our resources had engendered. Paucity means poverty. He heartily assented, nevertheless, speaking of Hamilton, to the Constitution, because he considered it as a band which might hold us together for some time. And he knew that national sentiment is the offspring of national existence. He trusted, moreover, that in the chances and changes of time, we should be involved in some war which might strengthen our union and nerve the executive, meaning give the president strength. Hamilton was not, as some have supposed, so blind as not to see that the president could purchase power and shelter himself from responsibility by sacrificing the rights and duties of his office at the shrine of influence. But Hamilton was too proud, and let me add, too virtuous, to recommend or tolerate measures eventually fatal to liberty and honor. It was not then because he thought the executive magistrate too feeble to carry on the business of the state, that he wished him to possess more authority, but because he thought there was not sufficient power to carry on the business honestly. An interesting distinction. He apprehended, meaning he perceived, a corrupt understanding between the executive and a dominating party in the legislature, which would destroy the president's responsibility and he was not to be taught, what everybody knows, that where responsibility ends, fraud, injustice, tyranny, and treachery begin. So if you follow what Gouverneur Morris is saying about Alexander Hamilton, he's saying that he believed that the presidency should be a monarchy because that would be the only way it could be conducted honestly. So back to Morris's words. Quote, General Hamilton was that kind of man which may most safely be trusted for he was more covetous of glory than of wealth or power. But he was of all men the most indiscreet. He knew that a limited monarchy, even if established, could not preserve itself in this country. Hamilton knew also that it could not be established because there is not the regular gradation of ranks among our citizens, which is essential to that species of government. And he very well knew that no monarchy whatever could be established, but by the mob, when a multitude of indigent, profligate people, meaning poor and reckless people, can be collected and organized, their envy of wealth, talents, and reputation will induce them to give themselves a master, provided that, in so doing, they can mortify and humble their superiors. Well, that is very prescient indeed. Morris goes on to say that there is no instance to prove, and it is indeed flatly absurd to suppose that the upper ranks of society will, by setting up a king, put down themselves. Of the founding fathers, himself and his peers, he writes, quote, history, the parent of political science, had told them, meaning the framers, that it was almost as vain to expect permanency from democracy as to construct a palace on the surface of the sea. But it would have been foolish to fold their arms and sink into despondence because they could neither form nor establish the best of all possible systems. In other words, they would rather have something than nothing. Of the Bill of Rights, Gouverneur Morris said this, quote, these amendments are generally speaking mere verbiage, meaning only words. It is there written, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Morris goes on to say that very few Americans, quote, believed the amendments gave any additional security to life, liberty, or property. Very few in America, perhaps 20, could imagine that the very authors of the article just cited would be the first to violate it, and that in a manner so flagrant and shameless. And here he's talking about the consequences of the trade bans with Britain in this crazy lead up to the War of 1812. Gouverneur Morris ends his letter this way, quote, when misfortunes press hard, 
and not before. They will then listen to the voice, which in the wantonness of prosperity they despised. Then, and not till then, can the true patriot be of any use. End quote. So what Morris is saying there is that it's only when we hit rock bottom that we remember the wisdom that we once ignored and probably even despised. And it's only in that moment that the true patriot can ever be heard. So what's our takeaway? We often hear people, let's call it worry, about judging the framers of this nation by the standards of today, as if our present culture has some moral authority over the past, often using that as an excuse for past and present failings to right the wrongs of our collective ancestors. Yet here we find our most central and worthy founding father's history hidden for centuries, a guy whose public values and honesty exceed most of those that we see in leadership positions today. So in summary, the writer of the Constitution believed that the structure for the United States with its aristocratic governance body called the Senate and its electoral presidential election process failed. It failed at restraining the imbecility of the slave state oligarchs. The writer of the Constitution felt it was the best that they could do at the time, but that we could and should do far better and must. The author who drafted the Constitution recommended quarantining the wealthy in such a manner that would prevent them as much as possible from corrupting the voting process. The writer of our Constitution was a New Yorker, an East Coast intellectual who was well-read with French ancestry, who believed in religious freedom and using the powers of government to help those struggling financially. He believed in investing time and energy into good city planning and nation planning. He was the originator of a national identity. The author of the Constitution believed in a popular vote for choosing the president, and he advised eloquently for the absolute necessity of designing government in such a way as to incentivize good behavior. Otherwise, government would attract the worst. He advised that ethical leadership required the most careful cultivation of inner integrity and a dedication to the removal of self-interest, taking every effort possible to stave off corruption. So from this point right now forward, if anyone ever wishes to use the Founding Fathers as an excuse to turn back time, to thwart progress, to excuse slavery and its effects, or justify the tribal domination of one people over another, we can refer them back to the author of our founding document. The true father of the Constitution saw himself as a citizen and representative of the entire world, as an advocate for ever working toward the evolution of a more advanced, peaceful, and civilized society.